Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm honored to be, have an opportunity to speak here at the uh, Fuller Future Festival. So when you're talking about sustainability, there's nowhere better to start than with the sun, obviously, since that is the source of all of our fuel, all of our resources, whether it even be meat, it's embodied solar energy, fossil fuels are also still embodied solar energy. It's just dirty means of getting to them. And photovoltaics is obviously what we think of when we think about accessing the sun's energy, but we don't have to have that intermediary step of technology in between us and what we've been provided with. If we design a structure in a way that will utilize it when we want direct light and shade it when we don't. Uh, those philosophies are along the lines of passive solar design, and that's what I had uh, implemented in with our house. Now, I love this uh, Bucky quote, dare to be naive, because that was kind of where I was at when I decided I'm going to draw, design, build, and be the on only uh, general contractor on a, a home that I hoped would be sustainable and uh, aesthetically beautiful and uh, aligned with certain uh, ratios like phi and other sacred geometry uh, proportions that occurred in a lot of uh, Bucky's work by the fact of the geodesic dome. But this quote works so perfectly because when you, when you talk about naive, that's defined by a lack of experience, check, I had that, and <laughs> a lack of judgment, and, uh, and that judgment was, in, lack of judgment, although it sounds negative, that can free you up of a lot of preconceptions about what is or isn't possible or what is or isn't conventional. Um, I think Bucky had come to that point in his life when he had lost a lot of his friends' money and he said, you know, I'm not sure that I'm right for this world, but rather than do himself in, he decided to become like an observer, like an outside observer and re remove himself of all context and just say what would be the right thing to do, not what is the accepted thing to do. And I think that unwittingly I kind of approached this project with such enthusiasm that it was out of naivete. And I also love the origin of this word is natural or native. And everything that I tried to implement in the design was a reinforcement or looking towards nature as an example of what is or what already has been designed and what works in trying to emulate it. I think that also that was something that Bucky tried to achieve. Looking at nature as an example of a working system that's beyond our ability to try to comprehend or beyond our ability to even try to manage, but just reference it, you know, stand in awe of it and try to get in harmony with it. Is, a, is, is the approach we tried to take. And this was the result. Now, you're probably saying, hey, that's not a geodesic dome. <laughs> but a lot of the same math that went, goes into a geodesic went into this. And I was insecure with my ability to probably construct a geodesic dome at the time when I built this. And this was a little bit more referential to what I knew architecture to be, this kind of rectilineal design. I was a big fan of mid-century modern architects, and at the time I was actually buying and selling uh, art and furniture from the mid-20th century that was uh, done by a lot of the famous architects like uh, uh, Errol Saarinen and Charles Eames. So that was the aesthetic that was kind of guiding me when I w built this house. And this is really, that was a result of my uh, dare to be naive. Um, my grandfather had built his house out of old reclaimed barn lumber and uh, my father has six brothers and they're all in the building trades and they use reclaimed lumber and they use it for an aesthetic reason. It looks beautiful, it has a patina and an age and a history to it that can't be faked with stain and things like that. Uh, so. The idea that you could build a structure out of reclaimed and recycled materials, I had seen it demonstrated for a couple generations in my family. I wanted to combine that heritage of the materials that come out of barns that were falling down and being allowed to dilapidate 
with a modern aesthetic that I liked out of the, the mid-century modern architects. And uh, I like this quote also from Buckminster Fuller, you know, just in that, you know, we can, we can shape what we want to see. We don't have to be passive and say, eh, that's just the way it is. You know, we have to use vinyl siding. We have to get materials trucked in from a thousand miles away. Um, that was one of the tenets. I wouldn't bring anything in further than 500 miles. And I don't think I even came close to that. Uh, the steel uh, frame inside of it was recycled steel. I think that was, came furthest away, but that didn't even touch the 500 mile mark. So these are a few of the architects that I was aware of when I set out to build this that really informed the shape of this building. And Louis Sullivan, as some of you probably already know, his famous quote has been boiled down to form follows function. And this is the long version of it, which is more beautiful, I think, and worth mentioning. It's the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic that from form ever follows function. This is the law. And this is, Louis Sullivan is credited with creating the first true American style in architecture. He re rebuilt Chicago after the Chicago fire, and he was the first to use uh, steel frame structure, and he's credited with being the father of the, the skyscraper. Architects up to that point had always referenced Europe as their aesthetic, because that was where the high culture was perceived to come from, particularly on the East Coast. The architecture always was a Greek revival or something that gave a nod back to Europe as the, the mother country. Louis Sullivan stripped that notion out and started building buildings that gave more reverence to their use than trying to um, emphasize or perpetuate this power structure within our society, this kind of top-down thing. This came from the bottom up and it gave more emphasis to the structure and that's where he used these steel frames and stuff. His chief draftsman was Frank Lloyd Wright. He continued this notion of a, a truly American aesthetic. Uh, he did Falling Water here, uh, I think that was 1935. And uh, his quote right there says it all. He began to think about nature and how the building would aesthetically join with it. They hadn't yet started thinking about sustainability, but just from uh, the beauty of marrying it to the natural environment rather than standing in contrast to it. So he began, he kept this going. Uh, Charles Ames came along and he uh, built on all of this and then made it fun, playful, whimsical. These other guys required, you know, commissions from wealthy families to build these homes that consumed a lot of money. He, Charles Ames came in and democratized architecture and design and did it for the masses and, you, and began to use some sustainable materials so that from a cost standpoint people could afford it, not necessarily from a, a sustainability standpoint, but he was trying to democratize design and give it to everybody. He felt like everybody deserved good design. Charles Eames actually collaborated with Buckminster Fuller in 1959 and that was the same year this building was built. We had, the United States had an exchange with the USSR at that time to try to bridge a little diplomacy during the Cold War. And they got to put an exposition on in New York, which 1.1 million people had attended. And then in return, the United States put on an exposition in Moscow, which 2.7 people, 2.7 million people attended, which totally blew away all their expectations even despite the Soviet Union's effort to try to maintain and minimize the number of people seeing it, uh, because it was all of Western culture on showcase there. And the man hired to plan it out was uh, George Nelson, which was the head of uh, Herman Miller at that time, and Charles Ames was one of his designers, and he had a relation relationship with Bucky. Charles Ames was also a filmmaker. He did the Powers of Ten film, which you may have seen, where there's a uh, uh, it starts on a hand and then it zooms out to see you, uh, at, a, at a power of 10 you see a couple laying on a blanket on the beach and another power of 10 you see that they're on the Mi Lake Michigan in Chicago another power of 10 and, a, and so on out to uh, you know the cosmic level and then back in 
to a subatomic level just to, to, it was just an interesting experiment for him. So he was in charge of making a film for this event that captured the whole totality of American culture in 1959. And all of this would be within this uh, George Nelson plan here. Now this circle right here in the center, that is a Bucky Dome, 80 feet tall, and it, it was covered with anodized aluminum that was gold. Now, you can see it there in the background, it's gorgeous structure. Um, it looks a, a lot like the Union tank car building that he built down in uh, Louisiana as a uh, train roundabout. Uh, and it also looks like the one in, uh, actually in Wood River, Illinois, that's used for the same purpose. But uh, these structures at the time they were built were the largest freestanding structures in the world with no internal support. And you can see that it's blatant propaganda. Levi's was there, and this is their cowboy, you know, singing to the Russian people, and uh, they look a little dubious of it, you can see there. But, you know, I think what you're seeing here is the best that we had to offer, we felt, in the, in the, in the field of design and what our Western culture had achieved. And these, this is the array of screens that Charles Eames displayed his uh, film on. It's called Glimpses of America, and he just had a team of photographers go around in 1959 and take snapshots. Here's freeways. But you can see the ceiling of that dome, just absolute gorgeous, beautiful structure. That created the umbrella for all of this to be displayed in. And I think that this is what we were really showing them in Bucky's terms was our living rate. Up to this point, we had shown them our weaponry and we were aware of their weaponry. But what this did was they, sh they came, they showed us their livingry, we showed them our livingry and the best of what American design could achieve at the time. Uh, and of course, television was a big part of it. And I think this, and a lot of historians agree, this did more to melt the ice of the Cold War than anything. Khrushchev and Nixon had that famous uh, kitchen debate when he showed them a, a um, display of an American kitchen, and uh, it sparked a lot of talk and dialogue. Now, and it pushed things really forward. Unfortunately, within just a few months, the U-2 spy plane got shot down over Russia. That it was our spy plane, and it, that was our display of weaponry to them. So it rolled back all that progress that we had made by showing them our living room. That next year, 1960, Buckminster Fuller built his geodesic dome here in Carbondale to live in. It's a beautiful structure, and it contains tons of references to what you know, we call sacred geometry, an array of triangles, pentagons, hexagons, and those are the building blocks of all nature and creation. And this structure and all domes are man-made physical examples, I think, of the laws of physical nature acting on materials. This is, this is what a structure looks like when it's built in harmony with what is and you know, not trying to force what we want onto it. This is what you come out with. This is another structure that is a, a monument to physical forces as well. Uh, this is Errol Saarinen's uh, Gateway Arch in St. Louis, and he actually uh, designed this and created the curve by holding up a chain on either end and just allowing it to swag. That's referred to as a catenary curve. And so, and then you just flip that over, and the laws of nature designed it for you. You hold it down, forces act on it, and then you flip it over, and that's why it can be the largest freestanding monument in the world, because it's in harmony and it's in balance with the laws of nature. So this is another Buckminster Fuller quote. It's a great one. Don't fight forces, use them. And I think that that's echoed in his, his dome structures, that's echoed in the arch. I tried to apply that in the house by aligning it to seasonal sun angles and everything, and I can go into that uh, later as well. So, Another feature about not fighting forces but using them is acknowledging the fact that we are in a capitalist 
democracy and what doesn't make dollars doesn't make sense to, the, to capitalism anyway. So when you look at the home, it has a huge financial impact on our economy and our culture. So it's a great place to affect change. You know, when you take out a home loan, you're voting with your dollars when you go down and purchase tons of petroleum-derived products, you know, like vinyl siding, asphalt shingles, all these paints. Virtually, you can fill your entire home and, and make it out of petroleum-based products. It's entirely unnecessary. I wasn't going to do that for another reason. I get migraine headaches really bad. So if I come into a building that's got fresh carpet, fresh paint, lots of uh, VOCs, lots of fumes in the air, I can't stand it. Uh, lots of fluorescent light, I'll get, I'll get sick, I'll get a migraine headache. So when I came to spend my money, I'm going to try to have something that's filled with tons of natural light, doesn't have any VOCs in it. So I used reclaimed materials. They weren't treated with formaldehyde. It has a metal roof. It's re, you know, all the recycled wood. When you use reclaimed materials, you're also not contributing to deforestation. 90% uh, of the virgin forest in the United States was, ha, that existed in the 1600s has been cut down. So we're left with just 10%. So you know, building a home off the back of that remaining 10% was just, I, uh, my, uh, I just couldn't deal with that whole thought. Now, according to the National Home Builders Association, a home mortgage is usually 35% of an annual household income. So that's a huge way to vote with your dollars when you decide how to build and design your home. Now, residential home building within the United States is 18% of the whole GDP, and the US GDP is a quarter of the globe's. So you shouldn't think that the choices you make with regard to your home aren't having an effect, aren't having an impact. Those dollars are being tracked by marketing firms and research firms, and they're going to respond by providing materials and products that address those, those needs. So, um, you know, it, when you vote with your dollars, at least in our society, it has a global impact. Now, these were the, the three kind of prongs of the design philosophy that I went forward to make the house. I wanted to use reclaimed and recycled materials, reclaimed wood and recycled steel. I wanted to use the sun to heat and cool the home and, and then leave any of the remaining aesthetic uh, proportional decisions to a fee ratio or the divine proportion, it's sometimes called. So according to the EPA, we spend 90% of our time indoors. So those decisions made about that environment obviously impact our health in a huge way. 30% of the new buildings go up, have sick building syndrome, which is that result from VOCs sending, you know, from all those petroleum products, essentially making the indoor air quality unlivable. And another fact, construction and demolition waste accounts for 48% of the volume of landfills. That's almost half the volume of landfills comes from demolition of buildings and the waste from construction, which, you know, when you think of truckloads after truckloads of you know, what it would take to haul a big urban building down, you know, that's, that's where you come up with that 48%. The other sad byproduct is that obviously a landfill is going to be on cheap ground and the people that would be living within a proxim proximity of that cheap ground are probably economically depressed. And also unfortunately, many of the people who would fit into that economically depressed label would be minorities or recent in immigrants and all the incidence of asthma and other respiratory problems of people who live within a close proximity of a landfill because of all the particulate matter in the air from dumping they all have huge rates of asthma and respiratory problems and it's unfairly focusing on economically disadvantaged people so by not contributing to that it just ripples out in lots of different ways so around 2006, I began uh, accumulating reclaimed materials. And uh, this is a big truckload of floor joists. Those are 2x12s. And I used 2x12 floor joists as the framing members for the entire structure. I uh, ripped them down into 2x6s. And that's the walls are all 2x6. And I blew in um, cellulose insulation into those 2x6 walls. And which is just um, shredded up uh, 
cloth and paper, and it worked out really good. There's another truckload with some beams and stuff on it. There's what the uh, yard of it looked like while I was building. So again, I needed to be naive to think that I could function as like my own lumber yard, my own designer and everything, but it was truly a labor of love. And uh, first I built the garage as kind of a, a, a practice or experiment, which this was one unit of the house. It was exactly one fifth. I, the way I designed the house was like all on these five little identical units. And so I practiced on the garage first, although it's facing north and the house is mainly facing south. Everything went well there. I got uh, reclaimed barn siding there on the side of it and reclaimed stone on there. And uh, the stone came from the foundation of a church, which was only about 10 miles away from our house. So I palleted that up on these pallets and uh, trucked it over and began laying it up in the columns. I worked with a stonemason on this part, and I was just mainly the grunt laborer there. And then once we started prepping the foundation, we put the um, HVAC runs down first, down in the ground, so that they're actually insulated. And you can see over here, there's this mechanical room where I have a geothermal unit that blows into here for the times when we need to cool it. And we really mainly need to just cool this structure to take humidity out of it. It, 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 pretty, it does a great job cooling itself. So then the next step, we covered all that, laid down this thing called slab shield, which is the white background on these tubes. These red tubes are the radiant heating tubes, which the geothermal unit supplies this conditioned water from 300 feet down. Well, it's 250 foot wells. It goes down where the, where the soil is maintained at a constant temperature and draws the air and uses that as an insulation factor to pump the water through this, which is then trapped in a concrete slab. So the heat source for this house is the actual floor. The floor heats up, and it heats up through the uh, radiant heat tubing. It also heats up from the sunlight hitting it. Um, I, it's dyed kind of a burgundy color so that it has an even higher solar gain. And I'm not I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't have to factor in solar gain at all for the summer because it, there's no direct sunlight reaching the floor in the summer. There's no windows on the east or west ends of the home, which is where your main solar gain comes in because of the low angle of the sun at those times of the day. Uh, the south end of the house, however, has floor to ceiling glass. Now this is the, the steel frame, which after the, the slab was poured, it just, the steel frame was made from recycled car steel and it went up basically like a pavilion. So all the load bearing structure of the home was done when this pavilion went up. All the reclaimed materials were just to, cr to keep the elements out and to create interior walls and spaces within the rooms. That's about where the kitchen would be looking out there. Again, that's the steel structure. There's what it looks like all finished up and everything. Uh, this is the chimney. It's made out of the same uh, foundation of that church. And you can see I have some operable windows that are down there on the floor. And I'll describe how those work with the, uh, the whole thermodynamics here in a minute. Uh, there's a shot from the inside where you can see how the chimney goes in and out. There's a uh, fireplace on the corner. And I understand fireplaces aren't you know, sustainable, especially during like uh, lead standards. But, um, you know, I, I enjoy it. I wanted it to be for the ambiance. And uh, so I guess that's like the uh, decadent little treat in the house. Otherwise, there's how the uh, barn siding looks on the inside. I held back some of the nicer siding for the interior walls. And uh, this is an example of some of the uh, mid-century modern furniture I was buying and selling at the time. That's a, that chair was designed in 1959 as well by uh, Arnie Jacobson for the uh, Copenhagen Hotel. Uh, and again, the sun, when you're factoring in sustainability, is the main player. It's, it's the main driver. It's the source, obviously. I know that sounds so obvious it's hardly worth mentioning, but I think we forget about that a lot, especially when you look at these new subdivisions. They obviously never, ever considered the orientation towards the sun. Um, and that's the downfall of capitalism, where you see these homes are driven by resale value and, a, and, and trying to achieve a high appraisal value, 
that their mantra is not form follows function or you know, unite it with nature or anything like that. Their mantra is curb appeal. So you see these homes that, you know, if, if you spend $50,000 on a big gorgeous array of windows, you want that pointed out towards the street, whether that's north or south, or that's of no regard to you when you're trying to live by curb appeal aesthetic. So you have, you know, all your money on the street side, and a lot of them, it's almost comical to see they look like a, uh, like a um, movie prop where there's this veneer of wealth on the street side and then around back there's virtually nothing, uh, you know, vinyl siding, there's all the masonry and windows and all the monies out on, on, on the curb side. But, you know, if, uh, I, I got some ideas for how that can be remedied here and I'll share them with you in a minute. Um, another fact about electricity use and resource use Buildings consume 72% of the electricity used in the United States, and 57% of that electricity comes from coal-fired power plants, which is obviously a terrible means of generating electricity, especially when we have tons of free sun electricity pounding on us if we just knew how to utilize it correctly. This is a shot of the house in the summer, and you can see that these um, operable windows across the bottom here are cracked open. This is the south side of the house, obviously, and there's a sloping hill that goes down into a, a big valley. And so this would be the southwest corner of the house. So as in where we're at in the summer, the prevailing winds come out of the southwest. So as they come out of this valley, they accelerate when they hit the side of this hill. That's how we chose this site. And then as they hit the, the house, this chimney coming out serves a function also to further accelerate it as they hit that and then come in low right here on the, the concrete slab that at this time of the year is in full shade. Now, this is, this is what the drawings look like. This is the south side, floor to ceiling. These are under 12 feet of overhang, so they never receive any light. Now, this is the north side. These are all operable windows, also underneath an overhang, so in the uh, winter, we're not getting that cold north wind coming in, but we do get light through here, so we don't have to have the lights on very much. And these also, like I said, are, are operable windows across here, which will exhaust heat that gets trapped on the ceiling. You can see there's no attic in the house. There's no dead space. There's, that, that is 22 inches, I believe, of cellulose from a solid from the roof deck to the ceiling deck. So there's no, no void in there. It's like a nice warm hat on top of there. And it's, it's steel, so in the summer, it, it reflects any solar gain that might happen. And in the winter, it provides great insulation. This is the floor plan of the house. And uh, these walls, all these walls here are not full height. These ones here are not full height either. These are children's bedrooms, common area, bathroom, kitchen. There's the front door on the north side. And you can circulate all around the kitchen. These are my kitchen cabinets, which are just uh, slider closet doors. So you just slide them and then there's shelves behind there. And I've heard people spending $30,000 on a kitchen like, like that's what you have to do. But we spent, I mean, nothing. There's just shelves behind these. And it looks beautiful, I think. And then this is an office and this is the master bedroom closet utility room, and this goes down into the mechanical room where the geothermal units are at. There's the chimney and fireplace. So that's what it looks like. I think this is around October maybe. You can see the shadow on the wall. It's about halfway. This will creep towards the winter solstice, and, and at its peak, there's the north side again, what it ended up looking like with the reclaimed barn siding and the operable windows up top here. So it looked just like the picture pretty much. And this is how it actually functions by heating and cooling itself through the sun's energy. Uh, winter solstice, roughly December 21st, I think it bounces around between 21st and 22nd. The sun is at a 27 degree angle. So if, if I know that on, on, the, on the winter solstice at a 27 degree angle, and I, I know how high my wall height is, I know how much of an overhang to project out here to allow that to come all the way in. 
Now, on that date, 1,000 square feet of the house are in direct sunlight. So the solar gain inside of there is, if, if, if it's not cloudy, is almost too much. It, one week in July, the temperature was hovering around one degree or zero. No fireplace, no heat on. You mean December? I'm sorry, no, no, January, January. I said July, didn't I? Thank you. <laughs> January, the first week of January, hovering around zero. It was 80 degrees in there. No heat on. And I, had to, I even had to put the thermometer off in the shade and take a picture of it just to prove it and date and time stamp it. And that's almost too hot, but that was in the front portion of the house. In the back, it was in the 70s. Now that's, I mean, that's just you doing nothing other than design. That's non-mechanistic heating source. And then, of course, on the summer solstice, it's coming in at a 57 degree angle. So again, uh, I use this right here, geocoder. You can put in your uh, address and zip code, and it will tell you on a given date what the angle of the sun will be for where you are at. Now, again, wall height, projected overhang, and boom, it lands right at the foot of the of foundation, so it's in full shade. So it creeps in and out progressively during those, those times. The cooling function of the way the house is designed here is we've got that uh, southwest prevailing wind come in, cold air sits down on the concrete slab because cold air falls, hot air rises. So when that wind comes in from the south through this opening on the floor, it lifts the cold air off the floor, bringing it through the house, and then because of the ratio of the size of this opening to this opening, thermodynamics, the heat wants to go to this spot right here. So without the full height walls, we can exhaust any heat that's sitting on the ceiling out the back of the house. And uh, you know, it's a good idea if you're trying to do this to um, augment that with like a, maybe a whole house fan or something like that if uh, you don't feel like you have a good opportunity to utilize the prevailing wind. Now, here's a calculation that you can use to figure out how to store that solar energy that's striking the materials inside your home. It's funny, water is actually the best store of radiant energy or solar energy. I think it stores 60 BTUs per cubic foot. But short of having a pool inside the house, we went with the concrete. It stores 25 BTUs of sunlight per cubic foot. And the heavy stone, like around the fireplace, that's storing 38 BTUs. Now, obviously, the sun goes down at night. So you want to create this ratio of things that are receiving thermal gain to, to loss so that when the sun goes down, the amount of heat that you're losing is then radiated out of the stone and the concrete. And uh, it's interesting when you're in the house, you can kind of feel that moment happen. It start, you feel like, ooh, it feels kind of cool. And then all of a sudden, the, the floor, the concrete, and the stone turns loose of the heat that it's stored passively during the day by receiving that sunlight. And this is the ratio, two cubic feet of solar mass to one square foot of window. That's what you want to achieve to create that uh, equilibrium. And again, I learned that from the um, passive solar designs practices that came up in the 70s, right around the time of the oil embargo. People were thinking about these things, and then it kind of fell out of vogue. You know, Carter even had photovoltaics on the White House that Reagan promptly took off. So there's that um, naughty, unsustainable fireplace there. Um, I tried to design it where it has these ports on the floor. Now these are drawing cold air from outside the house. The problem that makes a fireplace unsustainable mainly is it draws the conditioned air out of the home and, and up the chimney. It uses it as fuel for the fire and sends it up the chimney. Now, but it, these, I have these ports that are ported outside so in theory, it should choose that air because it's colder than the interior air. So that mitigated it a little bit. And I had this um, log holder design that's um, more like a teepee style rather than a flat style. So it, it burns pretty hot with not a lot of wood on there. Um, again, all this is all reclaimed lumber, reclaimed stone. 
uh, it, uh, you know, I did find out through this process that the green that they're talking about with green building stands for money. <laughs> and that money comes from the extra labor that it takes to do it. Now, I, don't, I didn't feel too bad about spending extra money on labor. I mean, my wife might disagree, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't easy to bring this baby home. But that money gets spent to people in our community. I mean, that money stays close to home. Uh, that's not getting exported out to um, you know, some huge timber company that's raping a forest in Seattle or wherever, or Dow Chemical or any of that. It's going to people that I see in the grocery store spending money with another local business. So it's, it's, you know, if you're spending extra money on labor, that's money you're giving back into your community. Uh, there's the kitchen. That's the, um, those sliding doors that function as our cabinets and everything. And this one actually back here slides open and it's an actual doorway where you go into the utility room. And the front door is behind this wall. There's a bathroom. Um, my uncle had a storm damaged walnut tree in his yard that we slabbed up and made into these countertops. And this is a uh, old table base from an auction. Um, all the furniture in our house is all reclaimed. Everything is um, all reclaimed. This is all reclaimed furniture in here in the kids' rooms. These chairs actually were in the um, lobby of the Sears Tower. I got them from an auction in Chicago. And uh, this is actually um, old, uh, was um, like department store display wall where you can click in shelves and stuff to it. I thought it was a good, good use of that. And uh, there it is at night lit up. Now, through all that effort, this is the bottom line for the dollars and cents part. The average home in our climate uses 12 kilowatts per square foot annually during the heating or cooling seasons. Offices 19, I kind of threw that in there because I work out of a home office. And we do have five people in there. But our house uses four kilowatts per square foot annually. <clears throat> so it's only about a third or 70% less. I get on here to the point where I had to make the aesthetic decisions about the house. All the other decisions up to this point were guided by the site, the natural environment, the time of the year, sun angles, prevailing winds. And so the decisions that were left would obviously just be aesthetic decisions. And again, I, put, I left that up to nature. And uh, I used uh, fee ratios to make those decisions. This was a quote by uh, Plato. And uh, he had this over the door of his academy. And uh, historians think that it's not necessarily, he's not saying so much you have to know geometry to come in here. But in his day, ge a geometer was someone who studied geometry. And that word, geo, is earth. Meter is measure. So you needed to be a measurer of earth. Or you needed to look at your natural environment and seek to understand it through observing it, measuring it, and knowing it. And you know, in his time, uh, they would have believed, obviously, that it's the hand of the creator. And the best way of knowing the creator is to know his creation. So that's a purely materialistic way of trying to know the creator by knowing his creation. But Plato believed in it. And a ton of scientific discoveries come from that same line of inquiry. Now, this is how you come up with a fee ratio or the divine proportion. You take a line segment, divide it at the point where if you divided A into B, you would yield the number phi. And the number phi goes on infinitely without ever creating a pattern or repeating. It's an irrational number. And it was fascinating to the Greeks. And it's fascinating as well because it, that ratio and that number occurs through all physical matter that is naturally occurring in a growth pattern. Within our body, it governs our entire body, our circulatory system. As it branches, as a new branch of it comes off of the old branch, that branch is a, happens on a phi ratio. As a tree grows and a new branch comes out of the trunk, that happens on a phi ratio. Within the veins of the leaf, where, where they branch, the way a river branches, all material growth patterns behave on a phi ratio. So 
why this was used in buildings and used in antiquity to create an appealing aesthetic is that our brains, having evolved within a natural environment, feel good when we see this proportion, like this is good, this is comfortable, this makes sense to me, so you subconsciously receive it as a positive thing. They've done studies on people's faces and stuff, like how closely their features adhere to a fee ratio is directly proportionate to how uh, attractive that person is perceived as being. So I tried to include that throughout the house. This is, when you, this is the same idea applied to rectangles. If I were to divide A into B, I would yield phi. And if I were then to divide B into the overall AB, that would also yield phi. Now that red crosshatch on there, which was here, was what I, I came up with as my little ruler that I, once I had my drawing down, I put this over the top of it. And if anything was close to that, I would, I would nudge it over to this section right here. So examples of that. First, I, I, you know, I'm just intuitively doing this. I don't know really why um, the ancient people did it necessarily, or at least at that time I didn't feel like I did. But hey, if it's good enough for them, if it's good enough for uh, Chartres Cathedral and Notre Dame and the pyramids and the Parthenon, why not? So the, the elements of the home that I felt like were the most significant would be the fireplace, the sources of water, like the shower and the bathtub and the sink, and where we sat and ate. And so I tried to, first I put this fee ratio on the fireplace to decide where to put that, locate that at on the overall plane of the house. Then I put one on where our shower is. I thought, hey, if I'm going to be in there trying to recharge, I could use maybe some fee mojo right there. And I you know, didn't want to leave the kids out, so I put it on where the kids' bathtub is. And uh, this one was a funny little coincidence. Whenever I visualized the interior of the home before it was built, I always visualized it from standing in front of the sink there. And that one just happened because when you start applying this to the overall structure, it just starts to happen on its own. And there's where you would be standing and uh, on, 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 the, on this one right here. The, and there's, there's another perspective on it. This one is where our kitchen table is. And it's just uh, the crosshairs there are right on a light fixture that hangs over the kitchen table right there. So when you're within that environment, feels comfortable, feels pleasing, cuts across all demographics and types of people. We're in a rural area. We have a lot of hunters and hillbillies. And uh, I don't mean that negatively. I mean that in the best possible sense. They come into the environment. They're like, this is nice. This feels good. This is comfortable. You know, you got some snotty high-end people who may be more into the furniture design and stuff like that. It appeals to them as well because it appeals to their humanity and what's good about nature. There is uh, another example of how it's calculated out on the exterior of the house. And it, it's echoed throughout the, the home. And it overall works to give a, a nice, pleasant environment. This is another example, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, how they use the fee ratio throughout to create all the different proportions within it. It's in tons of significant buildings throughout history. Here's the fee ratio demonstrated on our finger. Uh, tip to the first knuckle divided by the tip to the first knuckle divided into the overall to the second knuckle. This into this will yield the fee ratio. The green line into the blue line will yield the fee ratio. The blue line into the purple line. And this goes on through the entire body. Every single proportion of natural growth is on the fee ratio. It's fascinating to me. And it also was to tons of significant scientific minds throughout history. I mean, they would spend lifetimes uh, puzzling over this and finding examples of it in nature. Um, most of the people termed as geometers during that time would have been looking up at the heavens, seeing these patterns emerge as in planetary movements. And uh, many of them fall under this definition of sacred geometry. And Bucky used all of these tools, all of these natural building blocks of nature in, in his designs. 
um, because he was also a huge fan of uh, the creator or source or nature or however you want to term it. Uh, Kepler had this quote, which uh, basically says geometry is God, or at least evidence of God. And this, when I showed before the, the rectangle proportion of the phi ratio, this is how you grow that out. And as, you know, each box, this one into this one's a phi, and vice versa, you, you create this spiral, spiraling out. And this echoes throughout all of natural creation, even in the uh, hurricane patterns. And again, all of this is a reflection of solar energy's interaction with Earth energy. When they meet and they mingle, this is what comes out. It's on a galactic level. It's on as things as simple as a pine cone. This is just how it works. This is how it is. And uh, the way that the seeds are arrayed on this sunflower. And this one, to me, when you look at it, you can almost see like a five-pointed um, array start to come out of the center of it. And uh, the pentagram, or uh, pentagon, starts to kind of emerge there. And that was really key in Bucky's designs, and especially when you start getting into synergetics and the uh, vector equilibrium and the closest packing of spheres, all of that real, almost metaphysical um, knowledge that he was conveying is all tied to this, this notion of sacred geometry. And these are like the fundamental building blocks of all nature. So, you know, he was viewing it as the, really the, the primary or elementary moment when the creator's thought or idea was made manifest. And this was a big idea to ancient peoples in their creations of mythologies. And, you know, they were more into geometry and observing the natural world than we are today because we just have a lot more distractions and with television and smartphones and tons of media to seduce us away from you know, the greatest show on Earth, which is the stars and nature and everything. Um, this was Pythagoras who gave us the Pythagorean theorem. There is geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. He's referring to the planets at that time. And to me, this really hints towards where we're at at the very edge of science with string theory and the notion that the vibrational frequency of a thing actually dictates the shape that it will take on. And he developed uh, through uh, reading um, Orpheus's writings the uh, eight string octave or the, the lyre, like whenever you, you know, that eight string instrument that you pluck, and that became a big symbol within mythology and at his time that you know, each of the eight strings had a different octave, and they also correlated to a planetary influence that the, then the mythology of that time anthropomorphized and put a human face on, like if it's Venus, you had a goddess of Venus, and it corresponded with a certain vibrational frequency that when you pluck that tone, it evoked a feeling of a love. You know, and we use this in music, we use this when we score music to evoke a feeling of love or passion. And, you know, Venus, the planet, literally has a frequency that it emits by its size, its velocity, and its mass that correlates. So I don't even pretend to try to fully understand it, but there's something going on here. Now, this is a further ex exhibition of a phi ratio within a pentagon. We got, you look at line segment A and E. If you were to divide AB into it, you yield phi. If you were to take AB and divide it into AD, again, phi. So the entire structure of this elemental building block of nature, the Pentagon, is all a phi based ratio as well. Now, the star obviously factors huge culturally throughout the ages. It's, it's, our, it's on our flag. It um, has huge symbolic representation. 
and it is actually the alignments of Venus where, where it, when it on five times as it goes around the Sun it aligns between the Earth and the Sun at five different points these are the dates that will, that will occur these are the Earth Venus alignments and if you were to they make a perfect uh, pentagon or pentagram and this was what geometers were paying attention to they were seeing these patterns emerge in the night sky and all the planetary movements have correspondence like this but I wanted to use the, the pentagon because it factors so largely in a lot of the work that Bucky did with the geodesic it's repeated throughout and triangles come together to form larger triangles, come to form pentagons, and they interconnect and create that lattice that he's referring to in those synergetic works that um, uh, he was uh, talking about is actually the framework upon which matter emerges into existence. Um, now again, we've crossed at this point from just merely talking about material structure into a more metaphysical, or beyond the physical structure, where him and the Greeks who preceded him and the Egyptians who preceded them thought of this world as secondary to a world of thoughts and ideas. That our thoughts and ideas reverberate and dictate what happens in the physical world. So whether you believe that or not, it, they did and they have largely shaped our culture. So we're living in a culture that was built on that notion. So it's good to at least have reference and deference to it, but Buckminster Fuller, I think, fully embraced it and worked in the tradition of Euclid, Plato, Pythagoras, uh, Newton, Kepler, Copernicus, and he is in that lineage. He is the closest thing that we have in this era, in this time, to a geometer, to someone who looked at nature, sussed out the patterns, detected them, and then used them in his creation. He wasn't arrogant enough to think that a man-made creation would be somehow superior to anything that already existed in nature. Just look to nature, it's already been designed to imitate it. Um, now this is the uh, tree of life from, originated in Egypt, but in today it's uh, with uh, uh, mystic Judaism or Kabbalistic Judaism. And this, in, in especially in Egypt, and now it's you in, in current times in the Kabbalah, it's, it's a prayer tool it's that it's a matrix or a diagram that you can meditate with or pray with. And the idea in ancient Egyptian times was that it was a thought intention tool to help you, you focus your thoughts and ideas, which is, which is prayer. It's a focused thought and idea that you are projecting out into the void and you hope that it will somehow affect and change the material world. This diagram, again, I'm not an expert on it, but as Janet mentioned in my intro, I drew a lot of promotional material for the, the, the efforts to preserve the dome. So for that, I had to redraw the dome in Adobe Illustrator for uh, you know, the promotional materials and stuff. And through doing it, I could really got acquainted with the geometric patterns that are, that are present there in the dome here in Carbondale. And it kept occurring to me, this looks exactly like a tree of life. It looks exactly like a tree of life. And just before this uh, speech, I, I laid out, well, this, this is a further evidence of it, how it merges with the um, uh, flower of life or egg of life sacred geometric shape, which... I mean, that could be a whole lecture in and of itself, but here is an aerial view taken from the uh, Holland Prize uh, blueprint of the dome here in Carbondale. And so that's true to form. And this was the place that I kept seeing the tree of life emerge out of. So I, I put it over the top of it, boom, it's perfect. I couldn't believe it. But there's the tree of life or the Kabbalah projected on top of this exactly. And as you begin to rotate it around the dome, it covers every single connecting point on the dome, except for where it connects to the ground. Every single intersection of member 
or connecting point, it covers it. And then out of the center yields a pentagram and then a pentagon, which obviously, you know, if he's working in the tradition of the geometers, I think that they would, uh, they would smile on that accomplishment. And I think it's just evidence when you work with nature and, and creation in mind and let that inform your design and you're in harmony with it, little synchronicities and things like this are bound to occur unless he deliberately did it. Um, when you think also too, I think in his autobiography Fuller said that the biggest influence on his life was his Aunt Margaret Fuller. And she was a huge fan of mythology and evoked tons of mythological heroines in her essays and writings about trying to resurrect the divine feminine spirit in America at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution when she was witnessing natural resources being totally exploited. And again, you know, that's a kind of a, a masculine drive to venture out forth into the West and take, take, take. Take from the indigenous people, take from, uh, you know, anyone. Take from nature, take, take resources, consume resources. She was there as an early voice saying, you know, we're mistreating our women. We are mistreating our resources. We are mistreating our indigenous people. We, she was an early even abolitionist. She was saying our, we're mistreating this uh, slave population. She, to hear her writings, it's almost like a person from the 21st century with all the foresight of, you know, looking backwards and knowing how to be on the right side of history. You know, she was, had that voice then. Now, she died I, before Buckminster Fuller was born. So he must have, this influence from her must have accessed him through her writings. But, and, and a large part of her writings are concerned with ancient mythology, ancient modes of thinking when we did, the, our relationship with the natural environment was one more of a nurturing relationship. That's where, you know, she's credited largely with being the first feminist ever. And, but she was thinking of it in an even grander sense than that, I think, that we need to respect the nurturing aspect of what we're given, not view it as a resource to be exploited. I think that informed Buckminster Fuller through everything that he did. And uh, well, he said so, that she was one of the greatest influences of her life, over his life. Getting back to here, now, and in reality, again, we're living in a capitalist democracy, which in order to affect change in it, I don't think at this point we can sit and wait for politicians to do it for us. I mean, we can do it through our own behavior, but uh, through my experience building this home, when it's all said and done, all this sweat and toil with the getting the reclaimed materials and everything that was put into it, you go to have it appraised, it is a ranch house. It, the appraisal, the effort that was put forward there to make it energy efficient and all of that is, yeah, that's wonderful. I got a little, you know, local press and stuff out of it. But it didn't show up anywhere in the value of the home. If we created legislation that mandated that the energy efficiency of how the home operates after construction was a part of the appraisal value of the home, I think that would change people's behavior to instead of shooting for this curb appeal concept with their current McMansions, if the value of the home was tied to its energy efficiency of how it, you know, you could have the utility bills audited for a year and find that out. That would affect the behavior of how people built homes. And given all that data I showed earlier, how big a portion homes are to our personal income, 35%, and how much they are to our national GDP, I think that was 18%, and the fact that the US GDP is 25% of the global GDP, if we could change the way we behaved and built our homes and place the value on their efficiency rather than their waste, you know, and LEED has done a good job of putting forth some standards, but uh, getting their stamp is cost prohibitive, at least it was for me. I think at the time, to go through their whole process, 
it was going to maybe be 10 grand at the end. Now, I can't do that, but I, I got their standards and I read them all. And, uh, you know, I, I adhered to a lot of them and learned a lot from them. But, um, you know, and that at, in the end is nothing more than, you know, when you get that lead standard, that's almost just like a bragging right or, a, you know, a little ego boost or something to possibly market yourself if you're a business. It's primarily probably for businesses to say we're lead approved in their commercials. So, but if we could get legislation that took into account the efficiency of the home after it was built and the amount of resources expended in the construction of it as well, and we could take both of those criteria and have that included in the appraisal in this capitalist democratic society, I think that's what would truly affect change. When it makes dollars, it makes sense and everybody will jump on the bandwagon. That's what I got for the day. <laughs>